Folks, I think some Christians are going to lose their jobs. I think some pastors are going to lose their freedom. So if that's true, if, if the day is coming when American Christians are called to pay a price for following Christ, well, what do we need to remember? What do we need to learn to prepare ourselves? Jesus never promised his followers an easy path. In fact, he told his disciples that the world would hate them. He sent them out as sheep among wolves. Jesus' words came true in the life of the apostles, and they're still coming true today in the lives of his followers around the world. Join host Todd Nettleton as we hear their inspiring stories and learn how we can help, right now on The Voice of the Martyrs Radio Network. Welcome back to The Voice of the Martyrs Radio. My name is Todd Nettleton. You know, almost every week we talk with believers in Jesus who are going through persecution for their faith in Christ. Or we talk with those who are reaching out and ministering among persecuted brothers and sisters. Or those who are sharing the gospel in hostile and restricted nations, places where persecution is a constant possibility. Stories like these are so important to us as Christians in free nations, places where we don't regularly face persecution. We have so much to learn when we see how God is at work among our persecuted brothers and sisters, and when we see their faithfulness and courage. Not too long ago, I had a chance to speak to a group of American Christians about this topic, and I wanted to also share this message with you during our time together this week. I want all of us to be reminded why VOM workers travel around the world to meet with persecuted believers, why we pass their stories and their wisdom on to believers in free nations through Voice of the Martyrs Radio, through our free monthly magazine, through our books, through video productions. Why do we tell these stories? What about the possibility that that we in free nations, we too might someday face persecution? How can we prepare for that eventuality? And how can we prepare our children? I, I want to suggest one of the reasons that we tell these stories is because it might begin to cost us, American Christians, to follow Jesus Christ. The the day might be coming when you and I are asked to pay a price to stand up and be identified with Jesus Christ. Now, let me be 100% clear about what I am not saying, okay? I am not assigning a timeline to this. I'm not saying, you know, in September of 2022 is when pastors are going to start be rounded up. But what I am saying is we need to be ready for that day to come. Because, see, if we're ready today and it starts tomorrow, we're ready. If we're ready today and it starts 25 years from now, we're ready, right? So the purpose is we need to be ready because it might cost us, American Christians, to follow Jesus Christ. It's interesting the way Jesus described the kingdom of heaven in Matthew 13. The kingdom of heaven is like a treasure hidden in a field which a man found and covered up. Then in his joy, he goes and sells all that he has so that he can buy that field and own that treasure. Helen Berhane was here and spoke in chapel and also shared about the cost of following Jesus Christ. And I wanna share a little segment of our interview from VOM Radio about this subject. I decide to stand by faith, doesn't matter what it cost, because everything costs you price. When you buy a bread, cost you price. When you buy a car, cost you price. Also, when you follow Jesus, cost you price. Everything costs price. Everything costs a price. When you buy a car, it costs a price. When you buy a loaf of bread, it costs you a price. And when you follow Jesus, it costs you a price. Here's the challenge that I see for us as American Christians. For a long time, we got the treasure in the field without actually having to sell anything that we owned. We didn't have to give up anything. We got to have our cake and eat it too. But I think that may be coming to an end. I think the change may be coming where 
American believers like you and I, we have to pay a price. We have to sell some of what we own. We have to give up our popularity. We have to give up our political power. Folks, I think some Christians are gonna lose their jobs. I think some pastors are gonna lose their freedom. So if that's true, if, if the day is coming when American Christians are called to pay a price for following Christ, well, what do we need to remember? What do we need to learn to prepare ourselves? The first thing that I wanna suggest to you that we need to remember and hold on to with all of our might is the fact that Jesus is worth it. If we're called on to suffer for the name of Christ, that is something that is worth everything we have. The man, in his joy, sold all that he owned. Not out of duty, in his joy, because Jesus is worth it. In Acts chapter five, there's the story of Peter and the apostles being taken before the Sanhedrin and they beat them and they charge them not to speak in the name of Jesus and then they let them go. And this amazing verse, Acts 5, 41, then they left the presence of the council rejoicing that they were counted worthy to suffer dishonor for the name of Christ. They were excited about this. We have seen people, we, people have stood on this stage who exemplify that. They thought it was an honor to have the privilege of suffering for Christ. There's another brother in Sudan that understands that. Brother Matak was, lives in Sudan. After he came to faith out of a Muslim background, he was, first they tried to bribe him. You know, we'll give you a new job, we'll give you a nice house. Come back, come back and be a Muslim. No, I'm not gonna do that. Bribery didn't work, so they arrested him and they beat him and they tortured him in, in ways, this is more than 20 years ago, his body is still scarred by the torture that he endured. And yet, when our VOM staff was there and met with him, he has this joyful expression on his face and they asked him, how are you so joyful? Brother Matak made this amazing statement. He said, you don't understand, I was ready to die for Christ, and all he asked of me was that I be in prison and tortured for seven years. Jesus is worth it. Brother Matak would stand here and say, Jesus is worth it. That's the first thing that we need to grab onto if we as American Christians are gonna be called on to pay a price for following Jesus Christ. The second thing that I wanna suggest, if, if this is true, if persecution is coming, we as American Christians are gonna need some strategies to deal with it. I don't think most of our churches are ready for that. I don't think I'm ready for that. We're gonna need some strategies to deal with it, but, but here's the good news, and you guys know this, there are experts in dealing with persecution, and they are ready and willing to teach us. They're, they're the people that we print their stories in the newsletter. They're the people we write books about. They're the people you hear about on Voice of the Martyrs Radio. They are ready and willing to share their wisdom and knowledge and even the blessing of persecution with us. Over the years, as I have met with persecuted Christians, I always try to look at, okay, what, what do I need to learn from this person? What do I need to carry home for my church, for my Bible study group, for the VOM family? What do we need to learn from this person? And so I wanna suggest some of the strategies that our brothers and sisters have taught me over the years. Strategy number one, if persecution is coming to the American church, we're going to need to think differently about our Bibles. There's a great story in Nick Ripkin's book, The Insanity of God, and, and by the way, I've now done, I think, three interviews with Nick Ripkin and his wife. You absolutely should listen to them. They are amazing people. Uh, but The Insanity of God tells the story of, of Nick being in Russia and meeting with formerly persecuted Christians in Russia, and he heard an amazing story. Three pastors put on a conference for all of the young single people in their particular church network and they had about 700 people come together. Now this was such a controversial thing that the three pastors actually went to jail for three years because they put on this particular conference. 
And they said at the beginning of the conference, hey, we're going to play like a little game every day this week. I want you to gather in small groups, and, and I want to see how much of the New Testament and the four Gospels that you have memorized, that you can write down. And so over the course of this week, they gathered in small groups, and they began to write out the stories of the four Gospels. And they also wrote down the, the lyrics of choruses and hymns that they sang in their churches. At the end of the week, they kind of turned in their work and compared their notes. They had recorded all of Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John with only about a half dozen mistakes. They had also recreated the lyrics of more than 1,200 songs, choruses, and hymns of the faith. Now, this is back in the 1950s. On the day that Nick Ripkin heard this story, he was with some young people of the Russian church. Now, this was after the wall had fallen. This was after freedom had come. And he said, you know, what about you guys? How, many, how much of the Gospels do you know? And they said, well, not very many. And he said, well, let's not even worry about trying to be word for word with it. Just, you know, what are the stories that you remember from the Gospels? Not very many. And Nick Ripkin writes these words, I did see, however, what the Russian church had lost in its first decade of freedom. Under communism, the church had found a way to survive and often thrive. Scripture and holy song was its lifeblood. Now in a much freer day for the church, Scripture and holy song did not seem nearly as important. So the first strategy, if, if persecution is going to come to the American church, we're going to need to think differently about our Bibles. We're going to need to think a little more like the 1950s Russian Christians and not so much like the 1980s Russian Christians. But here's the thing. We don't have to wait for persecution to think differently about our Bibles. We can start that today. We can start it now. We can put this into practice now. So the first strategy, if persecution is going to come, we need to think differently about our Bibles. The second strategy that I want to suggest to you is that if persecution is going to come to American Christians, we're going to have to think differently about our prayer life and our time with God. This is a picture of Sergei Bessarab. He was martyred in Tajikistan on January 12th, 2004. He'd gone to a city called Isfara to plant a church. Now, Isfara had 126 mosques and zero Christian presence when Sergei and his wife went to the city to plant a church. Less than a year later, there was a headline in the local paper. The headline was, what's going to be done about Sergei Bessarab? A few weeks after that headline, Sergei was in the front room of his house, having his nightly devotional time, strumming his guitar, when three shots rang out, and he died on the floor in the room where their church met. A few months later, I was, had the privilege of going to Isfra, and uh, the, the holes were still in the windows where the bullets had gone through. They had taped over them, and uh, the church was still meeting in that room, and we met with Sergei's widow, and she told this amazing thing about Sergei. In the months before he was killed, Sergei's normal devotional life was two hours in the morning, Bible reading, prayer time, worship, and two hours in the evening, Bible reading, prayer time, worship. His widow told us that in the months before he was killed, he was praying and asking God to open up two more hours in the middle of the day. Because you see, he didn't think four hours a day in the presence of God was enough time. I find that story incredibly convicting. Because sometimes I think 15 minutes is a lot. Sergei Bessarab didn't think that four hours a day was enough. He wanted God to give him two more hours. As I've thought about that story and I've thought about Sergei going to heaven, I wonder if God met him at the gate and said, how about eternity instead? How about eternity instead of two more hours a day? You come in, you spend time with me. I think that might have been God's way of answering his prayers. So if there comes a time when we American Christians are going to be persecuted for our faith, we're going to have to think differently about our prayer time and our daily time with God. 
But again, we don't have to wait for persecution. We can do that now. We can start that today. A third strategy that I think our brothers and sisters would share with us if persecution is coming to the American church is we're going to have to think differently about the body of Christ. Several years ago, I was in Nigeria and I met these two pastors. They're from the same village in Nigeria. Their village has come under attack by Fulani herdsmen and by Boko Haram. And the two pastors shared that before the attacks began, they didn't like each other. In fact, they really saw themselves as being in competition because, see, if Mary goes to his church, then she's not going to come to my church. But after the attacks came, they were forced to get together, to work together, to see each other as brothers, to see each other as teammates. And they have actually become very good friends. When I met them, they both talked about how much they appreciated each other and their friendship and their co-workers together now. We in the American church need a dose of that. The fourth strategy that I want to suggest is if persecution is coming to the American church, we're going to have to think differently about our enemies. We have a lot of enemies in American culture right now, don't we? We have a lot of people who want to make us feel like somebody else is our enemy. But if persecution is going to come, we need to think differently about our enemies and Maybe nobody exemplifies this better than Dan Bauman, who was here and spoke in chapel, and we did the Voice of the Martyrs interview, and I want you to hear what he says about how God helped him think differently about his enemies. And it was the very first day when he was beating me, and again, there was no real sense of a reason why or a reason what was going on, and yet on that day, I felt like God speak to my heart as he was beating me that, Dan, I want to teach you to love your enemies. <laughs> and I remember thinking, not now, thank you. Because the reality was there was complete injustice of the moment as far as politics go. And so, yeah, love him. No, 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 no. I'll love other guys, but not this guy. And that's when I felt it strong again and again. Dan, I want to teach you to love your enemies. And I'll never forget when I was complaining almost to God, like, I can't do that. No way. This is too much not going to happen now. That I felt like God challenged me with another question, a statement. Dan, ask me what I think of him. And in that simple words came the reality that God changed the subject. And I love when God changes the subject. Because life was all about me, and yet at that same moment, there was something else going on, and that was what God thought and what God, how he cared for that man. So I stopped, and I'm like, okay, God, I don't understand, but what do you think of this man? And the love of God hit my heart. The love of God filled my heart. I began to realize that God did love this man, that he loved him forever. He loved this man, he loved his wife, he loved his kids. There was just one challenge, and it was that that man didn't know it. And the love of God hit my heart. While this guy's beating you. While he's beating me, yeah. And so it was, yeah, this change of subject. Yes, I'm feeling terrible while he's beating me. But yet at that moment, taking a second to say, God, what is on your mind? What is on your heart for this man? And that's when it overwhelmed me. If, if persecution is going to come to American Christians, we're going to have to pray that prayer. God, what do you think of him? Show me what you think. Let me see through your eyes. We're going to have to think differently about our enemies. But again, we don't have to wait for persecution to pray that prayer. As we finish up our time, well, you know, we've talked about strategies. We've talked about the fact that even if we are persecuted, Jesus is worth that. But let me share some good news. There are amazing blessings that are found, and they seem to only be found in the midst of persecution and trials. 
But let me share some of them. The blessing of unity in the body of Christ. We talked about the pastors in Nigeria. The second blessing is the blessing of seeing God's supernatural power in action. A third blessing is the blessing of seeing the lost one to Christ as they see the reality of faith in our lives. You may remember David Bile, who was arrested in Turkey and, and was here and spoke in chapel, and he shared about the fact that he has seen God work in so many different police stations and so many different jail cells that when the police knock on his door, he gets excited. He's like, somebody's about to hear the gospel. <laughs> Another blessing and the last blessing that I would point out is experiencing the joy of the Lord. Pastor Hassan was in prison with Peter in Sudan. And as we recorded the VOM radio interview, he talked about the fact that many nights while he was in prison, he had to sleep on the floor. And he said, I would just lay on the floor and I would cry. And I, you know, thinking, well, you were lonely for your family or, you know, you were mad that you had to sleep on the floor and other people got beds. And, uh, you know, no, 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 no. Jesus was so close to me and so real in that prison cell that I would just lay there and weep tears of joy at the presence of Christ. One of the blessings of persecution is experiencing that joy of the Lord that seems to be more real or come more naturally in those times of trial. Let's close in prayer today. Lord Jesus, thank you for this morning. Thank you for each person that is here. And Father, as we sit in this room, we know there are brothers and sisters around the world who are not comfortable right now. There are those in prison. There are those in police stations. There are those being interrogated. Lord, will you encourage each one of them? Will you give them the words to say? Will you give them the strength to go on? And Lord, through your Holy Spirit, would just right at this moment, would you let them know that somebody's praying for them, that they are not forgotten, they are not alone, they are a part of your body, and that the rest of the body is with them, is feeling their pain. Lord, I pray for American Christians to stand up boldly for the name of Jesus Christ, for the truth of the scripture. Lord, if the day is coming when we have to pay a price, Lord, make us willing, allow us to suffer victoriously. Allow us to show love to our enemies and allow us to experience the joy of the Lord even in the midst of difficult circumstances. Father, go with us into today in all that we do. Let us serve our brothers and sisters around the world and let us bring honor to you. In Jesus' name, amen. You're listening to The Voice of the Martyrs Radio. I'm Todd Nettleton. Today I wanted to offer a reminder about why we need the stories of our persecuted family members. You regularly hear, right here on Voice of the Martyrs Radio, from believers living in restricted nations in hostile areas. We need their stories. We need to learn from their wisdom. We need to be inspired by their examples. You can hear more of these stories from brothers and sisters around the world when you visit our website, vomradio.net. You'll find past broadcasts there. These conversations will help your faith to grow. They'll inspire you to know God's Word better, to be more bold in your faith. Again, all of those episodes available at vomradio.net. Or you can search for Voice of the Martyrs Radio or VOM Radio wherever you listen to podcasts. And while you're at the website, please sign up to receive Voice of the Martyrs free monthly magazine. There's a button right at the top that says free magazine. Just click on that. Give us your name and address. We would love to send that to you. Dr. Pam Arland helps to train and equip gospel workers to go to some of the most unreached people on earth. She was a key part of training John Chow to go to North Sentinel Island. It is John's story that is told in the June issue of The Voice of the Martyrs magazine. It's his inspiring example that we are honoring this year for Day of the Christian Martyr, which is coming up at the end of this month. We're going to talk about John. We're going to talk about his witness and his mission. We're going to also talk about preparing workers to go to places where they might not come back. 
That's next week right here on the Voice of the Martyrs Radio Network.